So we are going to cover the the seventh verse or part of the seventh verse, seventh body today. So let's just recap the previous body, the sixth one. The verse talked about how futile it was. This concept of this worldly tirath, yeah, going on these worldly yatras, and Guruji introduces a completely new type of yatra, because the previous shabad he asks for something, Gura ekde bujai, give me this understanding that sabna jiyanka ekdata, that everyone has this one data. That's the tirath that I should go on. That's the journey that I should go on. So Guruji says, Tirath Nama Jetis Pava. So Jetis Pava, this idea of grace, and we're going to see even today, has been quite heavy. In every single verse, we've had this idea, Jetiri Kirpa, if your grace, Jetis, Jetis Nadar Kare. Yeah, it's all about your Nadar, Karmi Ave Kapra. This whole idea, so many words of grace have been used in one way or another to say that only things can happen if it's according to your will. So again, this verse starts, if it's pleasing to you, if it's according to your will, without your grace, what can I do? This whole world that's been created that I can see, I can see that there's nothing that happens without your grace, without your kirpa. Karma means not your actions, but the divine grace. And we can even go into that. What do we mean by kirpa? What do we mean by nadar? What do we mean by your grace? Is the divine selective who it gives and who it doesn't give to? What do we mean by that? When karma ke milele. And it says, if I do get your grace, mat vich ratan jawahar manak, then I will find all the, the rubies and jewels and diamonds within myself, within my own mind, within my own intellect. If I listen to what the Guru's instruction is, yeah, then it ends in again Guru Ekdev Jai Sabna Jiyaka Ekdata Somev Sabna Jai. But it starts off, the verse starts off by saying how futile the worldly Tirath really is and what a new definition of Tirath is. What's the real definition of Tirath? So in this verse, it goes one step further. Look how Guru Nanak Dev Ji has time and time again challenged the conventional thinking. Right from the very beginning of Japji Sahib, it starts by challenging conventional ways of practicing taram, practicing religion. Socha, sochana hove, je sochi lagwar, chuppe chup. All of those are challenging conventional thinking. Yeah, And even in Tirath Nama, it talks about the real way to do Tirath, not the common way of doing Tirath. Here Guruji goes even further into other spiritual practices that are considered very high, very holy. If you can achieve these things, you must be someone great. So he challenges the people who are the most celebrated yogis, the most celebrated spiritual masters. And he's challenging their techniques. And he re-emphasizes this importance of grace again. So here it talks about J Jugachare Arja. The seventh verse. J Jugachare Arja. J means if. Jug is talking about the four jugs. And we'll go into that concept a little bit. The four ages. Chare. Jugachare. The four ages. Arja means lifespan. Arja means your lifespan. If you were to lengthen your lifespan to the length of the four jugs, if one's lifespan, if one's life spanned the entire four jugs, J Jug Chare Archa. So back in the days, Guruji's time, yogis would boast about this idea that they could extend their life. And we hear stories about people who've lived for a hundred, two hundred, a thousand years, ten thousand years, yogis who have slowed their breathing down so much and controlled their breathing that they'll take one breath every year or something like that. And they really slow 
they're breathing there. So this concept has always been around. The concept comes from the idea that breath isn't what keeps us alive. That the yogis have had this idea that behind the breath is life energy. Life energy is what keeps us alive. And that life energy is called prana. So the yogis have had this idea, these mythical ideas, that prana is what you're made of, your life energy. And when you breathe in, you're not actually breathing in oxygen and air, you're breathing in life energy. And that life energy is being transformed or transported rather through the medium of breath. So when you breathe in, scientists will tell you that your body is taking in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. But what the yogis say is that you're also breathing in life energy. And what they've learned to do, according to their mythology, is they've learned to slow the breathing down, but maintain the life energy. So they can say that we don't need the breathing, but we can just maintain ourselves on prana. In the same way, you have stories even today in India of people who say that they've stopped eating altogether. These great sadhus who say that we have no need for food at all. Why? Because through breathing, we're getting all the energy we need. Again, it goes back to this prana concept. And then this technique has been addressed. Pukhya Pukhana Uttari. Yeah, this technique. So Guruji is talking about the techniques that have been around. So this idea has been around that you can extend your life and you are a great Maharishi, Mahasadhu, a great spiritual master in some way, if you can extend your life. Guruji is challenging this concept. So let's talk about, it talks about a very interesting concept here, the Char Jug. And I just want to spend a little bit of time going into that. In fact, if you look into the mythology of the, the Char Jug, the four Yugs, the four ages, you'll find that it's actually quite endless. The mythology and the, the theories and the philosophies into the Jugs keeps going. There's a lot that you can read about this. But let's just cover this in, in a basic idea. There are four Jugs according to Hindu mythology. And they happen in a sequence. The first jug is known as Sat Yug. Sat Yug, the first jug. It's the beginning. It's followed by Treta. Sat Yug, Treta. Then the next jug is Dvapar. Dvapar. And the final jug in the cycle is Kaljug. Kaljug is known as the age of darkness and Satyug is the enlightenment age. Everything is perfect in Satyug and everything is weak, bad, being destroyed in Kaljug. So according to this mythology, we are said to be in the Kaljug era. We're in Kaljug. So according to Hindu mythology, the universe is constantly going through the cycle. It's constantly being created and then destroyed. And every time it's created, it's Satyug and then it deteriorates. And what's really interesting is it's almost like seasons. Like in a year, we have four seasons, spring, summer, autumn and winter. Hindu mythology extends that through a much bigger expanse of time and actually says that throughout time we have these four almost like seasons that moves from a sunny everything is happy everything is glorious season down to a dark almost like you can say it starts with summer and it ends with winter yeah it starts with daylight and ends with nighttime that's the kind of the theology behind it and if we think about it what we're talking about really is if you think about even whatever the, your understanding of the mythology is, the planet is actually not affected by this time. Yeah, the stars are still the same, the sun is still the same sun, the moon is still the same sun, the earth is still the same earth. So who is affected by this Satyug and Dwapar Treta 
who is affected by it, we're affected by it, yeah? So actually what this is talking about is a, is a change of consciousness, a change of our behavior, of our understanding, of lifestyle, of how we interact, yeah? There's nothing that says that in Satyug that the sun was shining brighter or anything like that. The sun is still the sun, the moon is still the moon. So really it's something that affects us humans. And it also says there have been also studies done as to when does Satyug start, what is the duration of Satyug. And this is where it gets quite complicated. The more and more you read into it, the more debates you'll find, the more people will will argue one way or the other that there's Satyug is like this, it's like that. But there's a general kind of, I'm giving you the overview, the, the kind of high-level accepted theories about Satyug and this Treta Dwapar Kajuk. It's generally seen that Satyug expands from a period of time which is 1.7 million years. Satyug lasts for 1.7 million years. Somebody's done some calculations. Whether those are human years or not, that they haven't agreed upon. Yeah, but they agree it's 1.7 million years. Treta is 1.3 million years. Dwapar is 864,000 years. And Kaljug is 432,000 years. But there's some, there's a, there's almost an interesting ratio that's behind it. The ratio behind it is 1.7 million years, then 1.3, then 846, then 432 years, matches a ratio of 4, 3, 2, 1. So if Kaljug is 400 and something odd, years old or duration of that long then satyug is four times the length of kaljug so if satyug has a period that is four times long then treta is three times long then two times long then one times long for kaljug yeah now this is where we can start to understand that there's symbolism behind these things so the way to look at it is Something that is four, has four, a length of four, has also been transformed into a different idea. Now, this is where we go into a different idea. Taram, according to Hindu mythology, is represented by a bull, an ox. Taram is represented by an ox or a bull, which has horns. And the universe is being balanced on the horns of the Taram bull. Later on, we'll come across this idea, Tal Taram. Yeah? Tal Taram. So this Hindu mythology talks about Taram. And we've talked about Taram before. Taram being the divine law. The universe is balancing on this divine law. The right way to live. The right purpose in life. The universe is hanging on that. But in Satyug, this bull has four legs. Treta is where the word three comes from. Treta, tre. In Treta, one of the legs is lost. So the bull is balancing now on three legs. Dvapar is where the word two comes from. Dva. We talk about dvat, dva. It's where we even get the word two from. In Dvapar, the bull has lost another leg. So now what well, the universe is not hanging on as much taram as it was in Treta and certainly not as much as it was in Satyu. So humanity is now less in taram, less behaving according to taramic rules. And in Kaljug, there's only one left, one leg left that this bull of taram is standing on. So we're hanging on by a thread. There's hardly any taram left on the earth, according to this mythology. In Satyug, everybody lived in taram. Everybody, there was no stealing, there was no crime, according to this kind of almost a romanticized fantasy of this of Satyug, that there was a time when people lived like this. Yeah? So that's where, why we get the words treta, three legs, dvapar, two legs, and Kaljug now has one leg. What those four legs of Taram are, 
are debated within Hindu mythology. Some say one of the legs is truthfulness, some say one of the legs is daya, compassion, one of the legs is contentment. What these four legs are, that's being debated. Some people have named them, and some of the Vedas name the four legs, some of the Vedas name different four legs. But the general idea is that there is this kind of sturdiness in Satyug, that the Satyug is balanced. The universe is very balanced in Taram. There's a lot of Taram in the universe. Now let's go to other concepts. I'm trying to bring a lot of different things that you might have heard of. It's almost all nicely wrapped around in this Jugs concept. So you have to understand this. In order to understand Hindu mythology, you have to understand this. Because Satyug was this perfect age, and again, there's not that much clarity why Satyug comes to an end, but it comes to an end after a period of time. It's like his time came to an end and then Trita came. There was no need for any avatar. There's no need for any incarnation of the divine. It's, it's like everybody is an avatar. Because one of the legs of taram is dropped, then you get to treta. There's a need now. People are not behaving as they should. Some of, there's lots of war between big kings. Ego starts coming into place. Yeah? And because of this, it is says that in Treta Jug, Ram has to be born. So the whole story of Ramayana happens in Treta Jug. The, there is a need for, for a character like Ram to be a beacon of light, a symbol of what Taram should be like, what mankind should be like. And this is why in Hindu mythology, they call Ram the perfect man. So he is the example of the perfect man in Treta Jug. In Dvapar Jug, Krishna is the avatar. And the whole story that you might have heard of Mahabharata, that happens in Dvapar Yuga. So no, no avatar in Satyug. Ram is the avatar in Treta. In Dvapar, it's Krishna. The whole story of Mahabharata happens there. So Krishna is like the ideal example of how we should be, the ideal Lord. Everybody looks to Krishna. And the whole Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is set around the teachings of Krishna. And it says that the Dvapar age comes to an end at the end of the Mahabharata story when Krishna feels his time is done, he leaves the earth. The moment he leaves the earth, that's the start of Kaljuga. And according to Hindu mythology, that's where it all ends. Now we're in Kaljug, it's all going downhill from here. Now you can understand when Gurbani talks about Kalataran Guru Nanak Aya. So according to Sikh philosophy, if this Jugs exist, it says, okay, we're in Kaljug, but the avatar of Kaljug is Guru Nanak. Guru Nanak is the avatar of Kaljug. He is the one that will save us and show us how to live in Kaljug. And what does Guru Nanak Dev Ji say is the way to live in Kaljug? What is his teachings? His teaching is song. Praise. Yeah? Kala Yuga mein Kirtan Pardana. So Sikhi is teaching that Nanak is the, is the perfect example in Kala Yuga. And his message is a message of Kirtan, of song, of Gaviye. Yeah? So this is where you can start hearing me. The, the references to Nanak and Kala Yuga all sit within this bigger philosophy. Yeah, so we have to appreciate what that philosophy is. Whether this is true or whether it's mythology doesn't matter. But Gurbani uses these references. It doesn't really enter into a debate to say Satyug never happened. It doesn't really go into that. It says if you believe in these things, then and if you believe that this is Kaljug, then you have to understand that Nanak is the prime example of how to live in Kaljug. Guru Nanak is the savior in Kaljug. He's the one that shows us how to live in this time. In the problems that we understand Kaljuk to be, Guru Nanak will give us the solutions to those problems. Kal Taran, Guru Nanak Aya. To swim us across, to save us across in Kaljuk, Nanak has come to the world. So then we can start understanding some bigger context. Why, why do we use these references like, like Kaljuk? 
So let's think about this concept a little bit. And for today's discussion, I want us to focus on this idea. Hindu mythology and this Jugs mythology sees the universe constantly getting worse. Yeah? Eastern philosophy sees that the best time was back in the Satyug age, and over time, man has gotten worse. Yeah? Everything's get, getting worse. Where in Kaljug is just in the age of darkness, everything is bad in this time. And everything was good. So the Hindu mythology is that the universe was great before, mankind was great before, but now we're deteriorating. So in order to keep this alive, the whole mythology is based on revering the past. In the past, everything was glorious. Yeah? All the great Brahmgyanis existed in the past. All the great sadhus, everything was perfect in the past. So this mythology reveres the past, the past and sees the future as even worse. Whatever today is, tomorrow is going to be even worse because we're going down this downward spiral of Kaljuk. That's Eastern philosophy. Now look at Western philosophy. Western philosophy, rather than seeing the past as superior, sees the past as inferior and we are evolving. We are evolving. The past were all cavemen. They were all monkeys. They were all living in caves. They had no tools. They were uneducated, unsophisticated, uncivilized. That's how the West sees humanity. That's how it sees the past. And every day we're evolving. Every day something new is happening. Every day we are becoming better. We're becoming more intelligent. We're, our technology is getting better. Our facilities are getting better. Our lifespan is getting better. Hindu theology says that in Satyug, humans lived for 100,000 years. And now, barely we live 100 years. Western thinking says back in the day, humans barely lived 30, 40 years. If you lived to 40, it was fantastic. Now our, our age is getting longer and longer and longer. So it's very interesting. Which one do we fit under? Because both of them are theories. Evolution tries to present itself as this kind of doctrine. But it says that it's the theory of evolution. And I'm not dissing this idea of evolution. I believe in the dinosaurs and all these kind of things. I'm not saying anything else like that. I'm not anti-evolution in any way. But let's be clear that it is a theory. It's an idea of how the world worked. Nobody knows what men and women were really like 10,000 years ago. This is the idea, right? There's like, there's a, a Gora who's talking and saying, oh yeah, we came from monkeys, we came from apes. And the Eastern man says, you might have come from monkeys, we come from Devte. <laughs> you might come from monkeys, we don't come from monkeys. That's the difference. Your philosophy says you come from monkeys. Our philosophy says we come from Devte. Yeah? So it's a very different way of looking at the world. So it's, very, it's interesting for us to just say, well, where do we fit into the system? You, personally, where do you think? Yeah? What, what, what do you believe? Yeah? So in a way, the Western philosophy sees the past is always something poor and is worse. The future is always better. Today is good, but tomorrow is going to be even better. We're going to evolve. Mankind is going to get better. Yeah, both are fantasies. Satyug is a fantasy, and this utopia of the future is also a fantasy. Because something we're going to get to a state where humanity is going to be perfect. There's not going to be any crime and all that. That's also a future hope. And Satyug is also a past hope that there was this time when there was no crime. It basically they're leading to the same point. Yeah, where in the past there was something amazing, and Western philosophy is saying actually in the future we're going to be amazing. Neither of them is happy with the present. Nobody says that today is perfect. Yeah? And to some extent, the Sikhs, we've adopted this Hindu way of thinking. Because even now, the Sikhs, if we talk about how we use language, 
we talk about all the great Gursikhs were in the past. All the great Shaheeds were in the past. Oh, they were fantastic. They were like this and they were like that. Yeah? That the Gursikhs around the Guru's times were all doing in Tapasya all the time and they were in Samadhi all the time. And, you know, we revere the past. Yeah, we talk about our great singer, Singhaniya, the Shaheeds. We talk about them in this great reverence. So we see the past as great. Like we see today as nowhere near as good as when it was during the Guru's time. Yeah. So we, we also are, are adopting this idea that the past is better and now is not so good. And in fact, the further we get away from that golden age, the further and the worse and worse we're going to be. So to some extent, we're adopting Eastern way of thinking. So the idea is that Kaljug is this terrible time now. Now this is where the Gurus come in. The Gurus, the Sikh Gurus, have taken the Eastern concept where the past is everything perfect and today is everything bad, and they flip this idea on their head. Look what Guru Arjan Dev Ji says. Guru Ji says, Satyug Treta Dwapar Paniye. That the, the age of Satyug, Treta and Dwapar Jug are all said to be good. Paniye, they're all good. Kaljug Uttamo Juga Mahe. But of all the jugs, Kaljug is the best jug. Guruji is turning it on its head. Guru Arjan Devji says this. Of all the jugs, Kaljug is the best one, is the highest jug. Why? Because in this jug, Guru is here. And Guru has given us Naam. And with Naam, we can be saved. In the other jugs, the Guru wasn't there to, to, to guide people, and Naam wasn't the, the prevalent idea. In the old jugs, the idea was to do lots of good actions. Your behavior was the most important thing and doing lots of religious actions and needing to do uh, animal sacrifices was the thing to do and to go to holy pilgrimage. These are all past ideas. Yeah. In fact, when Guru Nanak Dev Ji has challenged all these ideas, he's almost to say these are all old. Yeah. Socha, soch na hove, chuppe, chup na hove. All of these things, these are old ideas. What's the idea of now? Today, now, Naam is the idea. This is the most important. If you're doing the old ideas, then you're living in the past. You don't really know what the right method is for now. Now, if you have Naam, Kaljug is not a problem for you. Yeah? Because we have Naam, Kaljug isn't a problem for us. So Guruji is flipping the whole thing on its head. Those Jugs are said to be good, but this is the highest one. Look how Guru Nanak Dev Ji talks about Kaljuk. So there's lots of, Gurujis have taken these ideas and really played with them and really sort of messed around with them to, to sort of deconstruct the standard way of thinking. Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, Kal Kalwali, Maya Mad Mita, Man Matwala Pivat Raha. Kal Kalwali. So Kalwali means the wine cellar. Kaljuk is the wine cellar. Maya is the wine that is sweet, the tasty wine, and the intox intoxicated mind continues to drink it. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji strips this idea completely that Kaljug is some, something to do with time. He says, why is Kaljug bad? Let's think about it. Because in Kaljug, the sun doesn't shine any, any brighter or any dimmer. The earth is still the same. There's still plants and trees and the earth is still the same, the world is still the same, stars and the galaxies are still the same. What's the difference? Only we are different. So he says Kaljug is only bad because of something called Maya. So Kaljug is like uh, an off license, a shop where all the Maya is available. Yeah? All the different drugs are available. The biggest drug is the drug of Maya. And the mind, and this is not, he's not just called, calling it. Um, just uh, any old drug. He's calling a very mitha wine, very tasty, intoxicating wine, and the mind keeps drinking this. Now see that Guru Nanak Dev Ji takes a very abstract idea and makes it relevant to us. He takes a very abstract idea, Kaljug, Satyug, Treta, all these things, and he says, actually, Kaljug is your mind, and your mind is drinking in the drug of Maya, the intoxication of Maya. So Maya and your mind is Kaljug. He strips this whole idea that Kaljug is something to do with this big 
time, philosophy, ages. He says, you're in Kaljuk now. Yeah, because your mind is drinking in Maya. It's lost in Maya. It's drunk with Maya. All of the Maya that you see around it, the Kaljuk isn't just, your mind isn't just trapped in it like a cage. Your mind is enjoying the Maya. Mind is completely just in love with it. It's drinking it. And this is what we do. We love this world as it is. We love our families like it's the best thing on earth. We love food, taste, music. We love our emotions. We love our thoughts. We love our friends. This is all Maya that we're intoxicated with. We can't see that this is Maya. We see this as like the most mitta thing. But really it's a wine. It's losing our connection. Yeah, what's the, what's the, what does a drug do? It makes you makes you lose your co- real, real consciousness. It takes you somewhere else. Yeah. So Barney's saying Maya is the drug that's taking you your mind in all sorts of directions. So we're not just a victim of kaljug; we're participating in kaljug. We're not a victim of Maya. We are making this Maya. Right, you can go into a into a, a an alcohol shop. It doesn't have to affect you until you drink something. If you can be in an alcohol shop and not drink anything, then the alcohol shop doesn't mean anything to you. It's just a shop. It's just a shop with lots of bottles. As soon as you start tasting, let me taste this one. Let me taste that one. That looks good. That tastes good. I haven't tried that one before. Then the shop affects you. In the same way, Kaljuk and Maya is not something that we're a victim of because, yeah, we're surrounded by the material world. But only when we participate, when we drink in it, when we start enjoying the Maya, then we're drawn into it. Then we're intoxicated by it. So this is Kaljuk. Kaljuk is this. It's not some big concept. It's not some big philosophy. This is Kaljuk. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji... Now, that, now it makes sense. Guru Nanak Dev Ji defines what is Kaljug and then he says, in this Kaljug, I have a solution. In this Maya, I have a solution. Kirtan is the solution. Yeah? And the other Gursiks are saying that in Kaljug, Guru Nanak is the solution. Guru Nanak is the savior because his technique is the one that will help us get out of this intoxi- intoxication. So we're not a victim of Kaljug, we're participating in Kaljug. Yeah? We are making Kaljuk happen. And how are we doing it? Our love for Maya. Guru Arjan Dev Ji says in the Shabad Hazare, yeah, if you've heard about the Shabad before, he says something very interesting which really starts to now pinpoint how we can interact and how we can engage with Kaljuk. He says, Ik kari na milte ta Kaljuk hota. He's talking about his love for the Guru. He says, for one moment that I don't meet you, then I'm in Kaljuk. Ik kari na milte. If I don't meet you just for one moment, then I'm in Kaljuk. This implies that if we are with the Guru, that Kaljuk disappears. Ik kari na milte, ta Kaljuk hota. Only then does Kaljuk happen. When I forget the Guru's wisdom. When I forget all the stuff that the Guru's taught me, when I don't live according to the Guru's mat, then I'm in Kaljuk. Why am I in Kaljuk? Because if I'm not in Gurmat, then I'm in Manmat. And if I'm in Manmat, if I'm in my Man, Man is intoxicated with Maya. So Maya and Kaljuk are synonymous. The antidote to that is Gurmat. When I don't have Gurmat, even for a second, For one second, if I get lost back in Maya, for one second, if I think, oh, that's a really nice handbag, that's a really nice watch, oh, that's a really nice car, even for one second, if I think like that, I'm back in Kaljuk. So Guru Nanak is saying that Kaljuk isn't something that we're stuck with. Kaljuk isn't something, it's not a prison. Yeah? Kaljuk is not a prison. It's something that we participate in, something that we go into. But Guru is now saying that, yes, you can go into this shop and you can be lost in these things, but there's somewhere else to go. There's somewhere else to take your attention. 
You can take your attention into Maya and you're in Kaljuk, or you can take your attention into Gurmat, into the Guru's way of living. And every moment you can live in that way, then you snap out of Kaljuk. Yeah? So Nam is like a boat that's carrying us across this Kaljuk. And we have to we have to practice Nam according to the Guru's way, the Guru's instruction. If we follow the Guru's instruction, Nam is the boat that saves us. Yeah? And then you start seeing a lot of analogies like we are in an ocean, we're drowning in the ocean, we're in an ocean of fire, the Guru is the boat that carries us across, the Guru is the boatman, Nam is the boat. We start seeing all of these sorts of analogies, but we have to understand the bigger context where it fits in.